includes an update from NATO's Executive Director Tom Bryant, who will speak about current and proposed legislation at the local, state, and federal levels, including the most important recent FDA regulations. Also, we'll hear an overview from leading market trend expert Don Burke, who's here to help us understand trends and insights in the tobacco industry. Finally, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Cretec International, who's partnered with NATO and supported the association's efforts to conduct these educational seminars. Today's seminar is made possible by our generous sponsors. We expend, uh, extend our appreciation to our platinum sponsor, Altria Group Distribution, and supporting sponsors, ITG Brands, Cretec International, and National Tobacco. Seminars made possible by their commitment to and support of NATO. Please also welcome Miguel Lopez, our platinum sponsor from Altria Group Distribution Company, to say a few words. Thank you, Bob. You bet. Thank you. Um, like Bob mentioned, I'm uh, Miguel Lopez Vergara. I'm an industry engagement regional manager with Altria Group Distribution Company. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Uh, and also a special thanks uh, to NATO uh, for all of their great partnership uh, throughout the years, uh, especially last year with all of the, the support and the work uh, and the resources they provided uh, to uh, help us uh, address a lot of the legislative issues, especially at a local level uh, throughout the country. So, so thank you and a round of applause. Uh, to you guys. Thank you. Um, Altria is extremely excited to uh, sponsor this event. Um, we truly believe that uh, seminars like this uh, really give the trade uh, the knowledge, the insight, and the perspective uh, needed to effectively uh, grow and protect uh, our business. So again, I want to thank you uh, for being here. Thank you. Okay, our first presenter today is Tom Bryant, as mentioned, as Executive Director and Legal Counsel for NATO. Mr. Bryant's work today on, Mr. Bryant rather, has worked on local, state, and federal tobacco issues at the retail, wholesale, and manufacturer levels since 1989. Tom is on the forefront of tobacco legislation and regulatory actions. Please join me to welcome Tom Bryant. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to welcome all of you to our NATO education seminar. We partner with Craytech International and the TPE to put these on each year at the show. And we're pleased that you stayed with us here this afternoon to learn about the latest tobacco legislation FDA tobacco regulations, and then Don Burke's presentation on market trends. The three topics that I'm going to cover are, one, state tobacco legislation, a real quick overview of what's happening on the state level. Two, local tobacco ordinances, probably one of the greatest threats to retailers out there that sell tobacco. And then three, FDA regulations, uh, the latest that's going on with the agency and their various regulations. So let's begin with state legislation. This map shows the 12 states in red that have bills pending this year already to increase cigarette and or tobacco product excise tax rates. Now, sessions just began a couple weeks ago, so this map is going to change. There will certainly be more. We're very early in the 2020 legislative sessions, so we're certainly going to have more than just the 12 states. Usually, in years past, we've had about 25 states consider bills to raise cigarette and or uh, OTP tax rates. When you look at vapor tax rates, this map shows the 15 states in red that have bills pending this year to either adopt a brand new excise tax on vapor if they don't have one already, or to raise an existing vapor tax rate. Now Massachusetts is shown in green there up in the upper, upper right hand corner because in November their legislature passed and the governor signed a bill assessing a 75% 
excise tax on the wholesale price of vapor products. So they are the latest one to adopt the new tax. Probably one of the most critical kinds of legislation that has increased in the uh, number and severity just over the past year are flavor ban bills. They come in two different kinds. One kind is a ban on either menthol cigarettes and or mint and winter green smokeless plus flavored cigars and pipe tobacco. And states with bills like that already introduced this year are shown in kind of the dark orange or, or reddish color. Now not every flavor ban bans menthol cigarettes, but a lot of them do and more are doing that. In fact, uh, New Jersey attempted to pass a menthol cigarette ban bill, but it was pulled back and not passed just a couple of months ago. And if you see up in the right-hand corner, I believe um, Massachusetts is in a striped green. They did ban menthol cigarette sales beginning June 1 of 2020, and they banned a lot of other flavored products. So the first state to actually ban menthol cigarette sales uh, is Massachusetts. The other kind of bill to ban flavored tobacco products is flavored vapor products. And the nine states in the dark blue on the map already have bills that would consider banning flavored vapor products. Sometimes they exempt mint or menthol or tobacco flavors. Sometimes it's a total flavor ban. And there are a lot of different variations within those bills. But again, this is just the start of the legislative session and we expect certainly more to happen. We're gonna move on to local ordinances. The number of cities and counties that have considered local tobacco ordinances has increased significantly just over the past couple of years. In 2019, just last year, and continuing into 2020, 18 states had cities, towns, or counties consider local tobacco restrictions in their various jurisdictions, and those added up to literally hundreds of proposed local ordinances. Some of the states here, the 18 you see, uh, but some of the most active are California, certainly by far probably the most active right now. A lot of flavor bans going on in California. Colorado, Oregon is just starting. Minnesota, my home state, we see a lot of it. Massachusetts, probably the uh, front runner prior to uh, Cal California taking over. And now New York as well. The main kind of restrictions being proposed has shifted and now includes restrictions on the bans on the sale of flavored tobacco products, and that can include menthol cigarettes, mint and wintergreen smokeless, flavored cigars, and also flavored e-cigarettes. Another surge in local activity that we've seen in cities and counties is the consideration of local cigarette OTP or even vapor taxes. So not only do you have a tax at the federal level and now the state level, you also have taxes at the local level in addition. One final restriction that we've seen involves placing a limit on the number of retail licenses that can be issued each year. In other words, the number of stores that are allowed to sell is limited, and sometimes it's less than the number of stores that currently have a license. So some are having their ability to sell legal tobacco products taken away. Now with all of these kind of local ordinances going on around the country, NATO has continued to help retailers. We've been working with retailers since 2012 on local. And we're working with them to respond to these local restrictions. More is being done every day through NATO to combat these restrictions. There's two new initiatives we've established just in the past year. They include the National Response Network, or what we call the NRN, and also the National Local Advocacy Alliance website, the NLAA website. The overall objective of the National Response Network is to partner with state and national retail trade associations to respond to local tobacco ordinances. Already more than 70 associations have partnered with NATO to do just that. This new network is set up so that these organizations receive an alert from NATO about a pending local ordinance. It provides them all the information they need, a copy of the ordinance, talking points to oppose these ordinances, and then they would in turn send those alerts to their retail members if they have stores located in the city or the county where the ordinance is being considered. That way we broaden the network. NATO has over 60,000 member stores, but we still need everyone working on this together. So that's why we've broadened this to the state associations and other national groups around the country. The goal is simple, to get retailers and even their distributor uh, companies engaged to contact their local officials and let them know how these ordinances, if they were to be adopted, would impact their businesses. 
The second part of this new local effort is the NLAA website, the National Local Advocacy Alliance. And you can go and visit that. It's nlaausa.org, and I encourage you to do that. That website is dedicated to nothing but local issues on tobacco uh, products. And it's there to help retailers learn about what's pending around the country in terms of proposed restrictions. Specifically, some of the key pages on that website. There's a local ordinance page. If you go to that website, click on a state, it will then list every city or county ordinance that's being considered or is currently pending. Then there's a take action page. where We've already drafted a letter that you can send to all the local city council members or the county board members. With a couple of clicks of the computer uh, mouse, you can send a letter opposing that right from the web page. Then there's a resources page with a lot of fact sheets and talking points on how to oppose these various restrictions. And together, both the NRN and the NLA website are the new tools we're using to help retailers respond to these local issues. Another tool that NATO has developed and is going to launch tomorrow is what we call the NATO Local Ordinance Tracker Spreadsheet. That is a spreadsheet that encompasses information on every single local tobacco ordinance dating back to 2012, eight years worth. That's how long NATO has been working on local ordinances. So if you need to see if an ordinance is pending, that'll be on NATO's website. You can go to that spreadsheet, you can find a copy of the ordinance, a description of it, and so forth. It'll also have a link back to the NLAA website, so you can send a letter to your city council members or your county board uh, members as well. But that's a brand new thing we're gonna uh, unveil tomorrow on the NATO website, it's gonna go live. It's being updated weekly. We're in the process of uploading eight years worth of historical ordinances on there. Everything current is already on there, but it takes time. We, we literally have you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not close to a thousand ordinances to upload on a historical basis. But if you're gonna open a new store in a city and you wanna know what is the uh, ordinance or the local restrictions for tobacco products in that city, this would be an excellent resource to go to. You can see the summary of it and then the actual ordinance so you know how to comply if you're gonna open a store in that particular city. Or maybe you want to find out if it's very restrictive to see if you even, even should open a store in that city. It'll give you that kind of information too so you can make a good business decision. Now with all of the local and state legislation that's targeting the retail sale of tobacco products, it is imperative that retailers build a relationship with their local and their state uh, elected officials. I can't state that strong enough. Part of being a retailer is not just selling products every day, but being active when it comes to restrictions on those very products that you're trying to sell to legal age consumers. You are simply the best resource to educate lawmakers. A lot of them don't understand the retail business, let alone the retail tobacco business. And we encourage you again to reach out to them invite them to your store. They're very willing to come for a store tour. Explain how significant tobacco sales are to your business. Tell them about your business model and what high taxes would do or a flavor ban. How many products would come off of that back bar if you're a convenience store or a tobacco store, all the shelves, if a flavor ban went in, a full flavor ban, menthol cigarettes, mint and wintergreen smokeless, flavored cigars, pipe tobacco, it's virtually gone because all pipe tobacco is flavored flavored electronic cigarettes. Try and visualize your back bar. How much is left? Probably about 15% of what you have right now. That's the impact. Then that translates into lost jobs and even potentially store closures. That's what they need to understand. And in the, when they understand it and a bill is presented to them or a local ordinance is proposed, they'll remember what you told them because they'll have become educated. And hopefully, if we get to them before the advocates do with that kind of an ordinance, we have a better chance of stopping that ordinance and protecting your retail businesses. So protecting your business now needs to become a part of your business plan, not just what you're going to sell the next day to consumers. We're gonna move into federal issues. On December 20th, President Trump signed into law a federal spending bill that included a provision to raise the legal age to purchase tobacco products. The bill amended the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. That was the law that Congress gave authority to the FDA 
to regulate tobacco products. Now, the actual provision in that new law is just one sentence, and it reads, minimum age of sale, it shall be unlawful for any retailer to sell a tobacco product to any person younger than 21 years of age. And that law went into effect on December 20th, about five and a half weeks ago. It is in effect. It is a federal law. Now, it's important to understand what the FDA considers to be a tobacco product, because remember, this law is part of the legal statute that gave the authority to the FDA to regulate tobacco products. So you cannot sell these products to anyone under 21. Some are obvious, some may not be so. Cigarettes, roll your own tobacco, cigars, smokeless tobacco, electronic cigarettes and vapor products, pipe tobacco, hook and tobacco, and even dissolvable nicotine tobacco products and nicotine gels. Those are all now illegal to sell to anyone under 21. The federal law does not make possession and use of those products illegal by an 18, 19, or 20 year old. That's important to understand. You just can't sell it to them. So if someone else buys it for them, that's legal age, provides it to them, it's not illegal for them to possess or to use it, just to purchase it. Now take it one step further. The FDA considers a tobacco product to include what they call a component. And this means that you as a retailer cannot sell components to anyone under 21 either. The FDA defines a component as a product to be used with or for the human consumption of a tobacco product. Now what does that mean? Some examples are this. Cigarette rolling papers or cigarette rolling tubes are components. Blunt wraps traditional pipes to smoke pipe tobacco. The electronic nicotine cigarette device itself is a component. And any cartridges, pods, and bottles of nicotine e-liquids are also components. So all of those things cannot be sold. But note that the FDA makes a distinction here. They also do not regulate what they call accessories. Now accessories are things like lighters, matches, or cigar cutters or a humidor. They may be used initially to consume the product, but they're not used during the consumption of the product. So those kind of things you can sell to someone under 21 unless state law or local law would uh, provide otherwise. The new federal law also requires the FDA to publish what is called an implementing regulation by June 17th of 2020, about five months from now. So the FDA has to publish a regulation to implement the age 21 law. But remember, it's already in effect. Basically, what that implementing regulation is going to do is the FDA is going to go back to its current regulations and replace the number 18 with the number 21. And that regulation then has to be issued to the public by June 17th. And then that regulation has to go into effect within 90 days. So probably sometime in September of this year, we're going to see this new implementing regulation uh, go into effect. That new regulation will also require retailers to card anyone who is under the age of 30 if they're going to buy a tobacco product. Right now, that age is 27. So they raise the minimum age three years. They're raising the age to ID three years as well. Now, in a guidance document that the FDA published in 2014, the agency states it does not directly regulate the age of store clerks. A guidance document is a federal agency's document that explains how they're going to administer a law. It is not law, it is not binding, but it's their kind of Bible, how they're going to enforce and administer a given law or regulation. Now, although local and state governments can have laws on the minimum age of clerks, this law does not set that. In fact, a law was, or a bill was just introduced in Indiana about 10 days ago that would set the age of a clerk in any kind of store to be 21. So a lot of people may lose their jobs if that bill were to actually become law. Now that same 2014 guidance document states that to have self-service displays of cigarettes, roll your own or smokeless tobacco, you need to have an age-restricted store. If you're non-age restricted, like a convenience store, you can't have self-service of cigarettes, roll your own, or smokeless. According to the FDA, this means that for age-restricted stores, 
No one under the, un, under the age of 18 can be present or allowed to enter. The FDA in a guidance document in 2014 extended that to the age of the clerk. So clerks in age-restricted stores currently have to be 18 years of age or older. It is likely when the FDA issues this new implementing regulation that they're going to raise the age of a clerk in age-restricted stores to 21 as well. Because that new regulation read, no one under the age of 21 can be allowed to enter or be present at any time. So it's most likely that they're going to raise the age of the clerk to 21. However, you have to ask, if you're an age-restricted store, you have to ask yourself this question. Do you have cigarettes, roll your own, or smokeless in self-service displays, even if you're age-restricted? If they're non-self-service, that won't apply to you because it's only when you have self-service displays of those three products that you have to have clerks probably age 21 or older. Even if you're a tobacco store, and everything's non-self-serve, cigarettes, roll your own, and smokeless, you can have a clerk under the age of 21 because you don't have self-service displays. So if you have non-self-serve cigarettes and non-self-serve smokeless, but you have self-serve roll your own, and you have clerks under 21, you may want to look at your business model and do you change that to non-self-serve roll your own so you don't have to lay those people off if the implementing regulation raises the age of the clerk to 21. This doesn't apply to convenience stores, to grocery stores, to liquor stores. It's only age-restricted stores because they can't have self-service displays of those products. The FDA never extended the self-service prohibition to cigars, pipe tobacco, hookah tobacco, or e-cigarettes when it adopted the deeming regulations and began to regulate those products in 2016. We thought they'd extend that prohibition. They did not. So any kind of store now can have self-service of cigars, flavored uh, cigars, pipe, um, a hookah, and, and so forth, uh, tobacco, and e-cigarettes. Most don't because of you know, theft or shrinkage purposes, um, and just to make sure that those products are only sold to legal age individuals. It is important to understand that this federal age of purchase law supersedes state and local laws. Every city and every state has to comply with federal law. So if a state or a city has adopted an age 21 law and it has an exemption for military personnel to be able to purchase tobacco products if they're under 21, so 18, 19, or 20 year olds, or if they grandfathered current 18, 19, and 20 year olds when that age 21 ordinance or law went into effect, they no longer apply. Federal law is supreme because states and cities cannot be less restrictive than this federal law. If you have a military exemption or a grandfathered provision for 18, 19, and 20 year olds, you are less restrictive than the federal law because the federal law has no exemptions. So those laws don't apply anymore. Now we've heard certain states are not going to necessarily comply with the age 21 right away. I'm a lawyer and all I can tell you is there is a federal law in the books that you cannot sell to anyone under 21. If you want to be compliant with federal law, you have to cease selling to anyone under 21 as of December 20th. If you're still selling to someone under 21, the FDA is conducting compliance checks and they may you know, come into your store so you run the risk of being cited if that's the case. However, when we ask the FDA about that very thing, retailers need time to retrain and reprogram their POS systems so they flag someone who's you know, under 21 instead of under 18, they said this. They're going to continue for some time to only conduct compliance checks with under 18 year old minors. But they didn't tell us when they're gonna switch to using someone who's 18, 19, or 20 to do a compliance check. So the best course of action from a retailer standpoint is to switch over as soon as possible, cease selling, to anyone under 21, even it means manually carding everyone until your POS systems are updated to detect if someone's legal age on their driver's license is under 21. Now there are a number of things you can do to comply uh, with that law. First, train your employees. They're gonna have to go through a retraining process. Second, inform customers about the law. They may not know it yet. It's been on the news, but they may not have heard that. 
Next, update your POS systems, like I've indicated, to uh, catch anyone that's under 21. Ensure that your employees don't sell anyone under 21 and order new signage. WeCard is in the process of ordering all new signage for um, 21. They ran out. I'm on the WeCard board of directors as well. And we didn't envision this federal law coming as quickly as it did. So, but get your orders in so it's on a back order basis. WeCard has on its site temporary age 21 signs that you can print down yourself to put in your store windows or your cash register area. NATO sent out their uh, WeCard temporary signs for you to print out. You may have already done that if you've uh, received those, just to get you some signage initially in order to comply with the law. Now we're going to move on to FDA. Several different current regulations that we're going to go through. The first is the new FDA Electronic Nicotine Delivery System Enforcement Policy. In early January, about three weeks ago, the FDA issued what is called their guidance document. Remember, that explains how they're going to administer a law. And they announced a prioritized enforcement policy involving certain flavored cartridge-based and pod-based electronic nicotine products, or they refer to them as ENDS, Electronic Nicotine Delivery Systems. Now, according to that enforcement policy, flavored cartridge-based and pod-based electronic nicotine products need to be removed from the market as of February 6, 2020. You can still sell cartridge and pod-based e-cigarettes that are either tobacco-flavored or menthol-flavored. Those are the only two flavors retailers will be allowed to sell. Any kind of store can still sell tobacco-flavored and menthol-flavored cartridge or pod-based products. Now, even if a manufacturer has already filed with the FDA what we call a pre-market tobacco application, a PMTA, for a flavored cartridge or pod-based product that is being banned as of February 6th, those products still have to be off the market as of February 6th. I'm going to explain what a PMTA is here in just a minute. The reason why the FDA selected flavored cartridge and pod-based e-cigarettes to ban is because their research showed that those are the kind of products that underage youth have gravitated towards using at very high levels. Now, if a manufacturer files a PMTA between now and February 6th or even afterwards, the product cannot come back on the market at that time. It has to go through a review process, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. Also, and this is important, the FDA says in that guidance that it's not going to take any enforcement action at this time, which means by February 6th, on any flavored cigars or flavored hookah. They were supposed to. They were considering it. So they're not requiring flavored cigars of any kind or flavored hookah to come off the market as of February 6th. The question then for you is, what is a cartridge-based or pod-based product? According to the FDA, a cartridge or pod-based ENDS product contains a cartridge or pod that holds liquid to be aerosolized and is a small enclosed unit that you have to attach or insert into a device. I mentioned a PMTA just a minute ago. It's important to understand that because there's a new deadline coming up for PMTAs as well, and I'll talk about that. A pre-market tobacco application has to be filed with the FDA by any manufacturer that introduced a new tobacco product in the market after February 15th of 2007, 13 years ago. If a tobacco product was on the market as of that February date in 2007, it is what is called grandfathered. It doesn't need an application to remain on the market and re to remain marketed. When a PMTA is filed by a manufacturer, the FDA has 12 months to review it. During that 12-month review period, the FDA can either approve it or deny it. If it approves it, then the product can come back on the market if it was removed, for example, on February 6th for cartridge or pod-based. If it denies it, then the product is illegally being marketed. Also, manufacturers have to file a PMTA 
for each of their SKUs. Not a whole family of products at one time. That's going to lead to numerous applications, and these are voluminous applications. A lot of information has to go into these applications, and it's going to be a significant cost. So we're going to potentially see an increased number of PMTAs being filed with the FDA. Now, while its main focus is going to be on these cartridge and pod-based electronic products, the FDA also said in its January guidance it's going to take action against these manufacturers and these products. First, manufacturers of any kind and any flavor of cartridge or pod electronic nicotine products if the manufacturer is not taking steps to prevent minors' access to those products. So even tobacco-flavored and menthol-flavored cartridges or pod-based products can be subject to enforcement action. Enforcement action is basically taking a product off the market. Now what manufacturers would they not be doing to cause the FDA to take this kind of action? Manufacturers, if they're not monitoring retail compliance, in other words, if their retailers are selling to underage people and manufacturers aren't stepping in to stop that, the FDA could take an enforcement action against that manufacturer. Or if they're not limiting what we call bulk sales of electronic nicotine uh, cartridge products, they will take enforcement action. Some manufacturers have now put limits on how many pods or devices you can sell to one person at one time in a 24-hour period. That's what the FDA is referring to. So if they're not doing that, their product, whether it be any kind of flavor, can also be subject to enforcement action. Second, the FDA will take action against every kind of electronic nicotine product if the product is being marketed to underage persons. Now listen to what I said, every kind of nicotine product. That's disposable, that's open system, and it's cartridge-based. If they find out those are being marketed by the manufacturer to underage individuals, they can take action to take those off the market. Finally, the FDA will take action against any kind of electronic nicotine product offered for sale after May 12th of 2020 for which a PMTA is not uh, filed with the FDA. So any product that came on the market after February 15th of 2007 needs to have a PMTA, be it cigarette, smokeless, flavored cigar, pipe, hookah, e-cigarette. If it wasn't on the market prior to February 15th of 07, it needs a PMTA. There is another application called the substantial equivalency application, where if the product you have that came on the market after February 15th of 07 is substantially equivalent to or almost virtually identical to a product that's grandfathered. But most of the new products that came on don't have that substantial equivalent type product to rely on. So we're going to see a rash of applications that have to be filed with the FDA by May 12th. If they don't file by May 12th, those products are then illegal and have to come off the market. If they do file, then you have another 12 months for the FDA to review those products and you can stay on the market during that time, but you have to file that application by May, 20, May 12th of 2021. Now back to their enforcement policy here. They're going to start enforcing that, like I said, on February 6th. Those products have to come off the market if they're cartridge or pod-based e-cigarettes. Enforcement actions by the FDA can be against manufacturers, wholesalers, and retailers. So as a retailer, you can be subject to an inspection by an FDA inspector. Now remember, even if a manufacturer has filed a PMTA for cartridge-based or pod-based products, except tobacco or, or menthol, doesn't matter. Those products have to come off your store shelves. The FDA has also informed NATO that if retailers have to return cartridge or pod-based products that are flavored because of this enforcement action, you don't have to have it off your store premises but you have to have it packaged up so it doesn't appear that it's accessible by the public. So it's got to be in the back room, boxed up, sealed, etc., ready to go back to your distributor or your manufacturer. If you leave it on the store shelves after, May, after February 6th and you have an FDA inspector come in, they can cite you uh, and fine you for having that on your store shelves. So at the very least, box it up and put it in the back room until it's returned to the distributor or the manufacturer or otherwise disposed of. 
Now, to be clear, this enforcement action does not apply to several different kinds. First, tobacco-flavored and uh, menthol-flavored cartridge or ENDS products. Those are okay after February 6th, up until May 12th. Any disposable e-cigarettes that are self-contained, you use them and you throw them away. Those are not banned as of February 6th, but they have to have the PMTA filed by May 12th in order to be able to continue to sell those products. Also, open system vapor products are allowed up until May 12th when a PMTA deadline falls. And bottles of nicotine, e-liquids, or e-juice are all right to sell any flavor up until May 12th. Then those also have to have PMTA applications filed. So I summarized in this, uh, this chart here what I've just been talking about. The first column is flavored cartridge and pod-based e-cigarette vapor products. Remove them from the market by February 6th of 2020. They can go back on the market if they file a PMTA by May 12th and the FDA then issues an approval order after that. The middle column, tobacco and menthol cartridge and pod-based e-cigarette products. They can remain on the market till May 12th of 2020, but then they can stay on the market if a PMTA is filed at that time and until an approval or denial order from the FDA. Finally, any other new tobacco product on the market since February 15th of 2007 can stay on the market till May 12th of 2020. If there's a PMTA filed, you have 12, up to 12 months until they approve or deny. If they don't file a PMTA, then it has to come off the market. Now, a recurring question for retailers is, how will you know if a manufacturer has filed a PMTA? NATO has asked the FDA twice, will it publish a list of those companies and the product for which they filed a PMTA? They've declined both times. Why? There are federal laws that do not allow a federal agency to publish any kind of information about an application for a various product because it would be releasing potentially proprietary information, confidential business information. We've argued with them that the manufacturer name and the product name is in the public domain. It's not secret. It's not confidential. But the federal law says they still can't even do that. So don't look to the FDA for a list of who's filed PMTAs. That would be the best way to do it, and we're still considering possibly going back to them. Uh, but we're looking at that carefully, but it doesn't look promising uh, in order to do that. So you as a retailer should now, I'd begin soon, contacting either your distributors that you buy these products from or the manufacturers if you deal directly with the manufacturer and ask them, one, have you filed a PMTA? And if they say no, ask them, are you considering filing a PMTA? And see what they say. If they have filed a PMTA, ask them for what is called the FDA Acknowledgement of Acceptance Filing Form. The FDA sends a company an Acknowledgement of Acceptance filing letter that we have received your PMTA application and is under review. Remember the 12-month review period? That is proof positive that they have the PMTA application submitted and you as a retailer can continue to sell that product. If they don't provide you that information, then you have to be suspect of whether you can actually sell it at the retail level. If they won't tell you if they're going to file a PMTA, you should also take that into consideration from your business practices. Do you continue to sell that product? Those manufacturers who are filing PMTAs will be very glad to tell you that yes, we have filed PMTAs. They'll be very glad to tell you or provide you the acknowledgement of acceptance filing letter from the FDA because they want you to continue to sell their products. Why would they keep that a secret otherwise? They want you to know that, that they're complying with the law and they want you to comply with the law. So start reaching out to your distributors and or manufacturers. We're gonna still try and work with the FDA but I wouldn't put much hope in them doing a PMTA application uh, list on their website. They do have on their website what is called the Voluntary Grandfather Approved Product uh, List. Remember the grandfather products if you're on the market by February 15th of 07? A manufacturer can file with the FDA a voluntary application to be approved as a grandfathered product. You don't need to, but you can. And if you do file that voluntary application, the FDA created a website, and it's on their FDA.gov website. Just uh, Google grandfathered FDA products. The website will come up, and you can search it. It's a big, long list. You can search it by company name and product name. So you can tell, are those products grandfathered? 
If they are, remember, no PMTA or an SE application for grandfathered products. They can remain on the market uh, you know, forever. So you don't need to worry about a PMTA. But that's one list you can go to. But those are for approved products that have grandfather status. The FDA, when it issues an approval order for a PMTA, will list an approved list of PMTA products. But that's going to be down the road. They're not going to tell you who's pending. And that's what you need to know in order to continue to sell them. So we're still working with the FDA, but like I say, it doesn't look promising that they're going to do that. So please, reach out to your distributors and or your manufacturers. There's one other um, issue we're going to talk about with the FDA, and that's their proposed cigarette graphic warnings. The FDA was given the authority by Congress to adopt new cigarette health warnings with pictures and new text warnings to replace the current Surgeon General warnings that you see on packages and advertisements. This is not the first time that the FDA has proposed these graphic cigarette picture warnings. They first proposed them back in 2010. But cigarette manufacturers sued to block those warnings, and a federal appeals court, a court struck down the warnings. Why? Advertising is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. It protects free speech. Free speech includes commercial speech, according to the US Supreme Court. Commercial speech is advertising. Product packaging and advertisements fall within that commercial speech. And the US Supreme Court said, we are not going to allow the government to mandate messages like that on product packaging. Because under the First Amendment, companies have a right not to speak a government mandated message. In other words, they can't force you to do it. The Surgeon General warnings were basically acquiesced to, but these are, are much different. So these new warnings, if adopted, uh, would actually replace the FDA Surgeon General warnings. There are 12 graphic pictures and 12 text messages to go along with them. This is the first six that they've already submitted to the White House Office of Management and Budget. They issued these back last year, and the industry submitted comments in opposition to these kinds of uh, pictures and, and the text statements. I'll just read a few of them. Warning, tobacco smoke can harm your children. Warning, smoking causes bladder cancer, which can lead to bloody urine. And they even talk about erectile dysfunction and uh, cataracts, et cetera, and blindness. These are the second set. Uh, similar kind of pictures to go along with the text warnings. These are what the FDA calls photorealistic graphic images. Before, they used more like cartoon pictures. So these are more like an actual photograph. And they're saying that that is more realistic. It's more factual. Because for a graphic advertisement, wanting it to be legal, it has to be factual in nature. Now, these new warnings would have to take up the top half of the front and back of every package of cigarettes. And the left half of the front and back of each cigarette carton and the top 20% of every cigarette advertisement would have to have one of those pictures and one of those statements. They would rotate on a quarterly basis. And also, one change from the law with the Surgeon General warnings. Under the current federal law, it's called the Federal, federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act. That's the Surgeon General warning law. Only manufacturers and importers are required to put that Surgeon General warning on tobacco or cigarette advertisements. This would now apply to retailers as well. Many retailers will include a Surgeon General warning if they create their own advertisements for their stores. They don't have to, but they do. Now, you as a retailer, if you create your own ads in-house, would have to have one of those graphic pictures and one of those statements on your ads. You have to rotate them. You have to file a plan of rotation with the FDA. How often are you going to rotate? Which ones are going to rotate, et cetera? So it's a new real burden on retailers if you create your own advertisements for cigarettes in your store. These only apply to cigarettes, no other kind of tobacco product. Now, just two weeks ago, the FDA submitted the final version of this new regulation for color graphic picture warnings to the White House Office of Management and Budget. There is a nine-step process for a federal agency to go through to get a new regulation approved. The OMB is the last step. They're at number nine. If the OMB approves this new regulation, 
then the FDA is going to publish the regulation and set an effective date. It's going to have to be some point in the future because companies will have to switch over all of their packaging, their carton packaging, their pack packaging, and even their advertisements to now do those graphic warnings. That's going to take some time. It's likely that if those pictures are approved by the OMB, that the industry would sue the FDA again uh, because it would violate their First Amendment rights not to be forced to speak a government-mandated message. I would think the manufacturers would step up again to do that very thing. Other countries, like Australia and so forth, have graphic warnings out there already, but for this reason. They don't have a First Amendment in their constitution. They don't have a protection of free speech. And even if they did, it hasn't been extended to advertising like the US Supreme Court has done here in the United States. So that's why you can see them in other countries, but at least not in the United States, not at this point. So it's likely there'd be litigation to that. If that's the case, then that will be delayed uh, uh, and not go into implementation right away. But I would think there'd be a time delay anyway because you have to retool all of your packaging for cigarettes, for cartons, and for advertisements. That ends my presentation. I know there's probably a lot of questions, so I'm going to do my best to answer them. Uh, Bob here has a handheld mic. If you have a question, we'll do our best to answer them. Please raise your hand and let him come to you before you ask so then the entire audience can hear. Tom, do components have to have a PMTA, like rolling papers, hardware, vape hardware? Um, no, they don't have to have a PMTA, only the actual tobacco product, the cigarettes, the roll your own, the smokeless. I've never seen any kind of requirement from the FDA um, that a tube have a PMTA or anything like that. No, just the actual products themselves. Good question. Over here, Bob, to your left. Do you know the application fee for the PTMA? Or, and also, is it May 12th if they haven't filed it, it becomes illegal right then to sell? Is it that date that it goes into effect? I'll answer in reverse order. Yes, May 12th is the final deadline date. If you don't file by May 12th of 2020, that product is then was called misbranded under the FDA law, and it cannot be legally marketed, and it has to come off store shelves and have to come off the market completely. I'm not sure of the actual filing fees for a PMTA, but PMTAs are very expensive. Let me explain why. There are a lot of components to a PMTA application. You have to have a full description of the product, ingredients. You have to have clinical trials with human beings uh, on the product. Uh, how did it research them from a scientific standpoint? Toxicology reports, ingredient reports, product samples, product labeling, the list goes on and on and on. Some of these PMT applications that have already been filed, and some have, are millions of pages each. And you have to have one per SKU. So it's extremely expensive to file a PMTA, and that's why I think you're going to see small and medium-sized manufacturers probably not file PMTAs on May 12th. Um, that's why it's so critical that you reach out to your manufacturers and suppliers to see if they do. Um, but it's not necessarily the filing fee. It's everything else that goes into the PMT that costs so much and they simply may not have the capital and the experience to put those together. So, good question. Other questions? Uh, what if the company's gone out of business, like for a, a, a vape that's on the sh shelf that's, uh, so they can't, if they're done, but I still have their products, then do I basically need to get rid of it then? If it's an open system type product, you can sell it up to May 12th, then it has to come off your store shelf. If it's a flavored cartridge or pod based, you have to have it off the shelf by February 6th. I think that's like next Thursday. Okay, that's got to come off. Um, so you got like a week. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The open systems March uh, May 12th of 2020. There was another um, uh, question right up here, Bob. Uh, Tom, uh, considering the PMTA applications, you were talking about trying to get the FDA to actually create a database to say pending or denied or 
whatnot, wouldn't it be easier to just go to Congress and have them just make like a you know a quick bill and get them to pass it in both houses and then require the FDA to create a database? We could, but to get a bill through Congress takes a significant amount of time, um, and they're now preoccupied with the impeachment issue. Um, so I don't see it happening anytime soon. It's called the dance of legislation. I read a book about it in, in college. Back and forth, back and forth. It takes forever to get a bill enacted. Uh, but the age 21 happened very quickly. Uh, so it can happen, but it may not be very likely. So I wouldn't rely on that as a possibility. I'd rather start talking to your suppliers and manufacturers and see what information they can give you. And they'll be upfront with you. At least I hope they would. Um, but if it's a smaller you know, manufacturer, like the gentleman behind you asked, they may not be you know, so inclined to file PMTAs. But you'll be able to kind of get that sense, I think, from talking with them. Or, I wish Congress moved so fast on every issue. I'm just not sure they'll do it on this particular one. So, because there is the option to go ask the manufacturers or sub distributors, are PMTs being filed or have they been filed? So, okay. yes, over question here. Question for you. I'm <clears throat> just curious about your perspective or your views on enforcement. All of this, these laws are great. It's, it's all a matter of whether the FDA enforces or not. Is there something that you've heard from them? You believe that they're actually going to enforce these? If I could just add one follow on. The PMTAs, I think, have to be reviewed in a year. Is that, I think, from May 12th? Just, they're going to get inundated with, mm -hmm. with applications. What do you think about a year? Okay. Um, first question about enforcement. Uh, there will be FDA enforcement against manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. They've come out and said that. How are they going to do that? The FDA contracts with an agency in every single state in the country to do their enforcement. Usually, it's a health department agency. They have a contract with them to go do compliance checks and what we call Part B inspections. Part A inspections are compliance checks to see if you sell to someone underage. Part B is to check for everything else. So they will have their inspectors out there in the field looking for products that aren't supposed to be on store shelves because those inspectors are already in stores. So yes, there's going to be enforcement. When that's going to start, we're not sure because they're still using you know, under 18 year olds for age 21, but this is a different enforcement. This is about products not being allowed on store shelves. So my sense is yes, there's going to be enforcement and they have agencies in every state in order that they work with and contract with uh, to do that. In terms of being inundated with PMTAs, you're exactly right. They will be inundated with PMTA applications. They don't have the staff to handle it. They are under a court order though, however, a federal district court in Maryland uh, did the May 12, 2020 deadline date to file. That court gave the FDA then 12 months to review these applications. The FDA, however, has what is called enforcement discretion under federal law. Enforcement discretion is the right to extend a time period for them to review an application, and the FDA can do that on their own. However, because there's a court order saying you have to do it within 12 months of the filing date, um, then I would think they'd have to petition the court to ask the court, we need more time. We simply haven't been able to get through all these applications. Court, will you let us use our enforcement discretion to extend the time to some time in the future? Okay? Now remember, it's 12 months from the filing date. So if a company files a PMTA today, the 12 months starts today, as opposed to May 12th. Okay? So it's on the 12 months from the filing date. Tom, I have a question. Yes, uh, Angel. If you could clarify certain products for me, I have some questions about specific types of products. So nicotine products that are, they have nicotine, provide nicotine that are not derived from tobacco. Uh, clarity on that, if that has to go through PMTA. Uh, 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 Tobacco-like flavors that I've been seeing, like tobacco woodsy or tobacco uh, swampy, or uh, there's tobacco in there, but there's a little bit of a kind of a, a, an edge. And then the other one is, um, what about products that are invented or, or created after the May 20th deadline? They create a new e-cigarette that can't be turned on in a public school or that kind of a thing. Okay. Um, any new product introduced into the market after August 8th of 2016 cannot go on the market until a PMTA is filed and approved. So that was the date the deeming regs came into effect, okay? So you go back to that date. So for the past two and a half years, you cannot have introduced a brand new product without first getting FDA approval. In terms of nicotine, generally they regulate nicotine-based products made or derived from tobacco. Okay. Um, I've also been asked the question, what about zero nicotine products? And there, 
in their guidance document on filing PMTAs for electronic nicotine devices, it's a gray area. They have a paragraph. Basically, it, it says this. Even if a product is zero nicotine, if it's likely to be used in a tobacco component, remember the devices are components, then that zero nicotine becomes part of that component and it becomes a tobacco product. If you can demonstrate to the FDA that it is not going to reasonably be used in a tobacco component, then it's not regulated by the FDA if it's zero nicotine. But you have to demonstrate that, that it can't be used in these other kind of tobacco product components. Because if it is, it sounds like the FDA is going to regulate them according to the language they used uh, in that very product. So, um, but if you can get nicotine from another source, they really haven't addressed that, Angel. Um, I think the other sources of nicotine, I've heard tomatoes can be a source of nicotine and some other type products, but I don't think that's very, you know, often the case. It's really the exception to the rule. So it really it's the tobacco leaf where the nicotine comes from, and then they will regulate that. Okay. Yes? Is somebody under 21 able to sell tobacco products? We haven't got the implementing regulation yet. And that's going to set the age of clerks most likely for age-restricted tobacco stores. But if you're a convenience store, grocery store, liquor store, you can have someone under 21 sell tobacco products so long as those cigarettes, roll your own, and smokeless are non-self-serve. So if you're in a convenience store and everything's behind the counter, you can have a 16, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old clerk. Yes, you can, even though the age to purchase is 21, unless a local law or a state law sets a minimum age of clerk. So you have to check with your locality or your state. Okay? And those are few and far between, but there are a few of them out there. When we get the um, uh, uh, spreadsheet up on the NATO website tomorrow, you can go on there and search for that kind of thing, if there's an age of clerk requirement for local ordinances. So use that. Uh, that. So look for that sometime tomorrow or beginning of next week. It, it'll be there to search for that very thing. Okay? Yes? Hi, Tom. I just wanted to get your uh, perspective on why the FDA elected to allow uh, flavored disposable products to be sold after February 6th. Um, there was a lot of lobbying efforts, um, and it was kind of a compromise to make sure the open systems uh, could still be sold uh, because the youth aren't attracted to the open systems. So there was a lot of lobbying and information provided to the president. It was the president who stepped in. And because the regulation was supposed to ban all flavors of e-cigarettes, uh, but then something happened. The president stepped in and said, no, we're going to only do those products which are, you know, the kids are gravitating towards, the, the cartridge or, or the pod-based products. So, but that's going to be short-lived with the May 12th date, okay, because you don't file a PMTA. Those are coming off the market, too. Yes, in the back. Yes, Henry. Tom, uh, have you considered having NATO be the voluntary clearinghouse for companies that have filed PMTAs by May 12th? Yes, we've considered it, and we're working with manufacturers because there's a potential question about antitrust violation if NATO were to do that, because NATO could be seen as coordinating efforts on the market to sell anyone who signs up, and then anyone who signs up would have a competitive advantage over someone who doesn't sign up. So we have to be very, very careful. So we're working with manufacturers, legal departments. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not an antitrust specialist. So we're working with them. It doesn't look likely, Henry. Okay. Yes, Bob, back there. Will CBD vape juice without nicotine need PMTA? The FDA does not regulate CBD vape juice um, at this point. Um, so that's not regulated. That's not going to come into play right now. Yes. So we have uh, state legislatures that are catching up with the federal law uh, to rewrite, you know, their Wyoming rules, for example, uh, where we're at. Is the act of that uh, kind of dangerous that there will be tag-along legislation along with that? Are you talking about age 21s? Yes. Um, every state has to change their state law to prohibit sales to anyone under 21 for this reason. Uh, it com comes from the, what is called the Sinar Amendment. It was a law passed a long time ago. And the federal government said, if you want to continue to receive mental health block grants uh, to states to pay for mental health coverage, then you have to make sure retailers do not sell uh, cigarettes and tobacco products to minors. 
So in the law that President Trump signed on December 20th, it states that within three years of December 20th of 2019, every state has to change their state law to go 21 to continue to receive those mental health sign our block grants. So there is an incentive for states to have to do it. You have the federal law, it applies anyway. But to get the block grants, states have to do the age 21 and then start compliance checks to make sure retailers sell at a certain percent of success rate for compliance checks. I believe it's 80% or you lose your block grants. So the states have an incentive to actually change the law. They have to or they lose their federal funding for mental health grants. Uh, for the 21 plus uh, for like rolling papers and whatnot, uh, ones that are based off of hemp and uh, say like uh, for non-tobacco use, can we still sell those to 18 to 20 year olds? Um, and I see that some like hemp products also say for tobacco use only and there's like a lot of variations in that. I was just wondering if 18 to 20 year olds can sell. If it's like a blunt wrap um, and used for tobacco products, the FDA will regulate those and those are a tobacco product you can't sell under 21. If it's completely used for a non-tobacco purpose and you can demonstrate it's not a tobacco product, it doesn't fall in that category, uh, cigarettes, roll your own, blunt wraps, et cetera, then that would not be regulated by the FDA and it can be sold. It depends on if it's considered a tobacco product under the FDA rules. And generally, a tobacco product has to be made or derived from tobacco to be a tobacco product. So if it's completely non-tobacco and not used for tobacco purposes, then it should not be subject to the regulation by the FDA. I'll take one or two more questions and we have to move on to Don. If there are more questions, I'll be in the back after uh, I finish here to answer more questions, but we want to make sure we get Don in too here with our time frame. So any other questions? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your attentiveness. Hopefully answered most of your questions. Thank you.